Well again folks in 114, today we're going to be covering uh, section 6 and 9, uh, as according to schedule of course. Today is February 22nd, All right, so 6 9, and then we just have one, one more I believe, for chapter 6. Um, now, uh, the packet that I have for you today is, some of it is redundant information, admittedly, but it's uh, the same thing explained in two different ways. I did that on purpose. Firstly, there's this overview. Um, you don't, you folks that are in Matt 114, you're not really responsible for anything, all right, except uh, anything but this, factoring as a technique for solving quadratic equations and or um, using the quadratic formula, which I bet m probably many people would go this route intuitively just because it's a formula. Um, the analogy that I like to use a lot of times when I'm discussing this is that, yes, it would work for everything, the quadratic formula, but it's kind of like swatting a fly with a bazooka. So <laughs> it's more trouble than it's worth. So you, there's situations you would reserve using this. Factoring as a technique is something that is a little bit more to the point to when you get good at it. Anyhow, I made this overview for my Algebra 2 and Pre-Calc classes, and I figured that you should have it just as well because it, you know, it broadens your horizons. You could see that ultimately you have many choices, right, to, to, to utilize, you know, with enough experience you would strategically decide, well, I'll do it this way or that this way, all right? But you really uh, don't have to do anything but try to factor. Now, having said that, um, well, with that, here's how you one would factor, at least if you're going to go about it in a particular order. Um, this is what I do myself, right? and I'll explain. This is a more verbal sort of explanation for factoring techniques, right? given any size polynomial, given something that's four terms wide, something that's three terms wide, something that's two terms wide. Right? To explain this in uh, more... Uh, symbolic, mathy way, I have this next sheet. This is again an overview, but this is an overview of factoring. This is a little bit more like the way something looks. All right. So once you, I would maybe start with this in fact, once you get acquainted with the four or five methods here, actually there's technically six here, um, because this is two things in tandem, all right? Once you get acquainted with these methods, then you could strategize, go back and go, all right, well, if I have something that's so wide, so wide, this wide, you know, or this wide, then I'll try something else. There's another technique called U substitution, which I'm not going to cover because you're definitely not going to have to worry about that. Um, here's just an overview of these, the uh, square roots of perfect squares. The numbers that are in red you see here are perfect squares, literally is if you had uh, you were taking the area of a, sh a square that was the same dimensions this way and this way all right and you know that when you take the area or you find the area that it's two things multiplied well if you took the square root of perfect squares um let's see i'm sorry not the things in red but the things over here the 1 4 9 16 25 36 they produce a whole number as an answer all right they're special essentially there are also perfect cubes all right, the equivalent of that geometrically would be volume. And it is a shorter list. 1, 8, 27, 64, 125. And then there's fourth roots. Um, the cube root of perfect cubes, the square root of perfect squares. And these are fourths, you know. They're good to know if you don't have a reference uh, to memorize because it will make you more strategic. That's the only reason I would encourage you to memorize something. Like the multiplication tables. Have you noticed that if you had to divide something, you're up a creek without a paddle if you don't have the reference, and the reference is actually multiplication, you know? So when you're factoring, especially radicals, this is helpful. Losing my breath. This is a strategy for factoring radicals. We'll get to this. This is just an overview of rules of divisibility. Um, if you're a little bit rusty, that is what you can divide by nicely. As you get a whole number for a quotient. Um, and then there's a word problem, which is interesting, so I'll go through this with you. Okay, 
So um, I would at least print the overviews, all right? And we'll go through this now, okay? In fact, let me draw you an overview as I am inclined to do. And I'll turn the light on. Um, this is a little bit of theory here. My glasses. Um, this is, has to do with the, um, to sort of position us in math world, you know, uh, where are we exactly? There are essentially types of equations to be aware of. And it is good to identify them, um, if for no other reason, uh, just to strategize. Right? So let me do one of the things I like to do here. Uh, sort of make a little border for myself. There's like a tendency to go a little too far on here. I'm not some scaffolding of my own. On this side, the, um, the left side here, right, the type of equations that you will see in this section, and probably for the semester, I, I would wager, are those that are polynomial based. Now, you, you, you're familiar with the term polynomial, I, I, I remember, right? Well, that me, a polynomial is an algebraic expression, and algebraic expressions are the building block of equations. So they're made from those. Anyhow, they have a peculiar look. Right? This is a model, basically. Something that is polynomial-based basically conforms to um, this appearance. It may be just a mono. It might be one term wide. That's why I'm putting this plus minus thing here, because remember, terms are separated by plus and minuses. All right, and a couple of, you know, some ellipse marks here to just indicate that it could be longer than this. It's a variable. I know that there are other letters here, but we use X predominantly as the actual letter, right? The actual var variable of interest. Um, and it might have an obvious coefficient up in the front. It's just that there are strict criteria that must be met in order to qualify as a polynomial. All right. Firstly, the, the number that would be sitting here, it has to be real. All right. It may have a vague inkling of what is the alternative. Imaginary numbers like the square root of a negative. The square root of a negative is an impossible question, basically. Right. Um, if the fact is of, of a radical uh, a radicand is the inside guts of a square root, say, for example. Um, if they can't be identical, then they can't be real. All right. Anyhow, this has to be real as a technicality. All right. The other thing that is probably more po uh, interesting is this. The exponent, if there is an obvious one, um, it has to be non-negative. And non-negative is... Um, an ambiguous phrase because what are the things that are non-negative? It's not just one thing, right? Essentially, um, a non-negative, I should continue, integer, which also implies something. A non-negative integer is basically something that is a positive or a zero, right? A positive whole number is an integer. Right. A negative whole number is also an integer, but in order to qualify as a polynomial, this has to be positive, right? Or it can be zero as an alternative. So we say non-negative integer, right? That's the basic building block if you are a polynomial-based equation. And again, the reason that a person ultimately cares is that there are a, a, a slew of rules that we would uh, apply, right? So we're trying to be strategic here, all right? Um, then there are two subcategories, essentially. There's the type that you've seen, and then there's the type that we're going to do today. Um, so let me just sort of, again, make a little um, scaffold here, border. Of those that are polynomial-based, 
um, we have solved linear equations. Is that has been broached as a subject. Okay. So there is an example of something that would be polynomial based, right? The type that are for today are the next logical step after a linear equation is a quadratic equation. Right. And you could tell one apart from the other because um, you just have to analyze the, um, the exponent, basically. That will it, it put you off in the right direction. All right. Um, I want to fill in the rest of this, and then I'll show you sort of uh, uh, how you can distinguish one from the other the, across the board. So I don't have a name for these other categories, so I'm just going to kind of group them together. All right. um, this is cheesy, and I don't like doing it, but... Rather than say uh, polynomial based, the equivalent, all right, these other things are, some of them are based upon uh, these two, all right, and some of them are truly unique. So I'm just going to put them together as other for right now. Let's just classify them as other, all right, and I'm putting them in green uh, just because um, they're not really what you're responsible for, but Again, it's nice to know where you are in the world, right? And that there are things around you, right? So these are the things just to be aware that they exist, right? Uh, usually in a math class, uh, say you are in Algebra 2 or um, uh, pre-calculus, the next thing after dealing with quadratic equations would be something like dealing with um, rational equations, Right. And then there's another one, radicals. Right. And then there's another one, um, the absolute value. Here's how they look, right, uh, in the most simplistic way of referring to them, right? Again, we're going to use basically the exponent as the identifying uh, key feature, right? the identifying mar uh, marker, right? So, um, in each of these cases, all right, uh, maybe just put a little example of each, their equations, so we know that there has to be what? There has to be an equal sign in each of these things. I'm not going to put in the other unnecessary features, all right? They'll be unique to a problem anyway. But in each of these, put a little equal sign, and right, just to uh, suggest that they are, in fact, um, equal. So put this one up here because it's going to be in the way. All right? And we'll give them each um, a variable, so um, x because that's my favorite variable and everybody should have a favorite all right, when it comes to math all right. and now the thing that would distinguish one from the other pretty easily all right if you're a linear equation your exponents could be no larger than one all right so and often math people don't even bother to write that you know Right, as they leave out zeros and decimal points and positive signs, one as an exponent is also an option. I would, for the sake of clarity, especially in the position of teacher, overstate the case, right? Right, as I would now, because it will help us distinguish with this from the others, right? But it isn't imperative. Right? When you have quadratics, the uh, the outstanding feature in terms of the exponent is square. All right, so it would be something that is uh, exponent of two no larger right, than that. Right? If you have rational equations, um, they come from this situation. They come from having, deviating from the requirement here for polynomial-based, non-negative integers, right? which means that they have to be either a positive or they have to be a zero. Right? Well, we know what exists other than those two things, negatives. 
So if you have, in fact, a negative integer, you will end up with a rational equation. That happens to be an alternative style of writing rational equations. This negative and then the exponent is more or less an abbreviation for this situation, where you have an equation that has an obvious top and an obvious bottom. So usually we just put um, a one here. So I'll put a one. And now you can see that it looks like a fraction, right? And once you've moved it like that to this bottom tier status, all right, it is a positive, all right? Negative exponents are an abbreviation for a fraction, essentially, right? Whatever is sitting here, technically it would be above the line. It would be a numerator in this position. We wouldn't bother putting a one here, really. But once you have sort of rectified it and it over explained what it is, it becomes a positive, okay? Perhaps what I should do is separate these a little bit more uh, boldly. I don't want these things to be confused. Right. All right. Um, then there's this, radical equations. Radical equations, again, the outstanding feature to identify them as such is that they have a fraction itself as an exponent. All right? Remember the criteria up here. All right? To qualify as a polynomial-based equation, you have to have a non-negative integer. All right? It's a whole number, essentially, here. And yes, this does make fractions itself, but what if the exponent itself is a fraction? All right? That is an abbreviation also. All right? When you have a fraction, what do you have? You have an obvious top and you have an obvious bottom as uh, the exponent in this case. And what that equates to is this. Um, it's an abbreviation for a radical, basically. All right, so, um, the number that would be here is known as the index. Again, you're not really responsible for this, which is the denominator. All right. So the number that is basically the denominator of this fraction would be technically the type of radical that you have. All right. And then you have uh, the actual letter in here. And then the numerator up here would go there, all right? All right, the last of these, again, just to, for the sake of consistency, is the thing that involves an absolute value, all right? An absolute value has its own unique symbol, all right, which looks like this, all right? So we're not dealing with exponents in this case. It has these lines, and these lines are referred to as an absolute value modulus. Symbol. Absolute value is concerned with the magnitude of something. Remember, magnitude is a fancy way of saying the distance from zero. Right? How large a number you have, really. All right. So, anyhow, the good news, all right, is that you already have experience in solving certain types of equations, linear equations, all right. But we're going to extrapolate, expand upon that, and now introduce some new techniques for this situation, right? These other things, again, in green, they exist, and I would just tell you because you can position yourself in relation to them, right? Be aware that they exist, but you're not responsible for these. Now, what are the techniques that you would employ, right? Linear equations you are familiar with involve basic techniques, which is to do what? Opposite operations. Right? If you are going to solve a linear equation and it says add, at least it's written as add, you know that you're going to subtract, say, for example. If it says multiply, 
then you know that you're going to end up dividing, right? And then you, to make it legal, what if you do to one side, you do to the opposite side, right? Both sides. That's the balancing technique. That's what makes anything legal in math work. What have you done to one side, do to the other, right? When it comes to quadratic equations, I'm just going to list a few. Um, the go-to technique is usually something called factoring in tandem with the zero product rule. All right. And for our purposes, the alternative is the quadratic formula. There are others. All right. Again, that's the whole point of this piece of paper. Right. You could graph, you could translate whatever you're given to, whatever is given to as a quadratic equation into y equals something. Right? And then if you had, say, graph and calculator, it's tell you a graph and calculator, draw the picture. And then stare at it where the, the graph crosses the x-axis. That's the answers. Those are the solutions. Anyhow, I described that here. You are not responsible for this. We're going to be factoring and using the zero product rule a lot. Right? And we're going to be using the quadratic formula as an alternative, right? The other stuff in here is also alternatives, but you're not responsible for these, right? These things in thought balloons here, right? There's some terminology, right? When we're talking about equations, there's a phrase that gets thrown a lot, around a lot. Standard form of a quadratic equation, which is not to be confused with the standard form of a quadratic function, which is almost the same thing. All right. Use this word, standard form. All right. When you see three terms, the highest being uh, highest degree being two, and they're all set equal to zero, meaning that there's a bunch of interesting stuff on the left, and there's a zero maybe on the right. All right. That's standard form. We like standard form for either this purpose or even this purpose. The inside guts all right, of the quadratic formula, which is written here, is referred to as the discriminant. All right. And the discriminant basically will help you identify whether you have real solutions, which is what you're hoping for, or maybe something that is a complex number that involves an imaginary number. You're not responsible for those, and you really shouldn't interact with them too much in this course, but they exist as a concept, at least. All right, anyhow, try to print that. Right. And let me give you one other piece of information, just to remind you, and we'll move on. Sticky today. I'm gonna have to shoot this with some um, uh, rubbing alcohol. I want to remind you of is this. I think I might have drawn this a while ago. Side thought here. We are familiar, of course, with polynomials at this point, right, which remember are a type of algebraic expression, building block. Um, but there are some subcategories, right? We are familiar with monomials and binomials and trinomials. And thankfully, above those, um, that situation, trinomials, there is no other specific name. Um, that's what I had alluded to here. All right. I decided to be very general when I was labeling this. I said, how do you deal with uh, factoring 
a four term wide polynomial, right? And then I used a three term wide polynomial and a two term wide polynomial. Well, if I wanted to be very precise, right? I would go with this phrase. Remember, polynomial is a very general phrase, right? Whereas monomial is a specific type of polynomial, right? And a binomial as well is a specific type. And a trinomial is a specific type. Beyond the nomenclature that is similar to something with wheels, like a bicycle has two parts, you know, two wheels, and a tricycle has three wheels, there's no name for things beyond three. Right? It would make sense totally to go, oh, a quadrinomial, right? Meaning it has four terms in that case, but they don't, they don't do that. All right. Anyhow, a mono would be something, at least if it's truly really algebraic, would be something like that. Right? Just x. A binomial would be something like x plus 2. And, and a trinomial would be something like x squared plus 2x plus 4. Yeah. I'm putting them in encapsulating them in parentheses is just to kind of make them more obvious that they're an autonomous chunk, all right? A mono, a bi, and a tri, okay? It is good to be able to refer to these because, again, for strategic purposes, you will decide what to do when you're given this situation, what you'll do when you're given this situation, and so forth, okay? Now, uh, I may have to turn on my projector. Let's see. do this and then I'll refer to my slides all right um, a little thought here just to keep you in mind here we're gonna explore the factoring technique to solve equations but before we get there we're gonna have to practice factoring so we'll do some basic factoring factoring essentially is dividing without consciously being aware of it. All right. It's basically the opposite of multiplication. All right. Remember that because sometimes you are given expressions and you're told to distribute them, right? which really means multiply. And sometimes you're given some uh, uh, some polynomial and they're asking you to factor it. Well, rather than multiply, when you factor, you're really dividing, you're just not consciously thinking about it. Okay. So here's an example. All right, we're gonna factor this expression, 4x minus eight. Now, let me refer to my sheets, and I'll skip the projections right now, just have the physical copy. You may already intuitively know what to do, good, right? If you have an intuition in math class, it's an excellent thing, right? But um, to give you some strategy and kind of refer to some names and things, right? Let's start with this. Get in the habit, all right? Any size polynomial. This happens to be a binomial because why? It has two terms, right? But any size, what you should start with, whether it works out or not, is this, factoring out a monomial GCF, right? And how that would look, this is a more verbal way of referring to it, is that there'll be something in red, in this case, outside of a parentheses, and then there'll be some leftovers written in blue here, inside parentheses, right? What I'm getting at, is that you're going to basically translate what you see here into these parts. 
there'll be something outside of a parentheses. And in this case, because it's a binomial, there'll be two things inside of a parentheses. Factoring is dividing, right, without consciously thinking about it. You're going to figure out what is similar in terms of these, the factors, right, of four and the factors of eight, and rip it out of each one of them, right? And that thing that you are ripping out, the thing that they've made in common, is the thing that goes on the outside of this parentheses. All right, I would always start with, especially if you're sketchy about this, start with this model, all right? Most basic technique, something on the outside, that's the thing in common, all right? And then what is inside here, that's the leftovers. Well, you know, it's not a technical term, but you get the idea. All right, now, I'm gonna put a little thought cloud above these. You don't have to do this every single time, but I think it helps in this instance. We're gonna consider the parts that make four. There's not a lot of them, right? Factors, things that multiply together that make four. I'm gonna put them in pairs. One and four, one times four would make four, right? And the other pair is two times two, all right? Then we'll consider the factors that make eight, all right? There's not a lot of them either. One times eight, and then there's two times four, right? If we're going to basically rip this apart to factor it, to make it look something like that, all right? Then what we need to do is we need to establish, first of all, the thing that they have in common. The thing that they have in common is the GCF, the greatest common factor. That is a fancy way of saying, maybe a more concise way of saying, the biggest factor that makes both four and eight. Right? And as you can see, everything is made of the number one somehow. And because these happen to be even, they also are made of the number two. But ideally, when you're factoring, you want the GCF, you want the biggest thing. So what just so happens to be the GCF in the case of four and eight? It's actually four itself. So that is the thing that you would put here on the outside of your parentheses when you're factoring, right? This is technically speaking, a monomial, and it's a greatest common factor, right? If you wanted to give it a name. Normally you wouldn't bother to do that. You would just simply write four and then a parentheses. But that's what its purpose is, all right? It's the greatest common factor. Now, as for the leftovers, again, not a technical term, the leftovers you can deduce by sort of thinking about the situation backwards, right? Four times what would be itself? Well, technically it would be one, right? And if there's nothing else to put here, then I would actually draw the one, right? What happens to be attached to it? The letter X. So we really just need to put the letter X, right? If you put one X, it's not hurting you, it's just overstating the case. That would be more concise. Four times X is four X, duh, right? Four times what is eight? Two. And therefore, when it's all said and done, because we have strategically chosen the greatest common factor, this is pretty much finished. Four times the quantity x minus two is the factored form of four x minus eight. Now, if you ended up with some junk here that it was possible to go a little bit further, you would have to employ some other step, right? But it's not gonna happen in this case. You're done with this. When the GCF at this point is no bigger than one, right? You're finished. We already found the GCF as being four, so we're finished. All right. Uh, let's see. Now, um, again, to explain this diagram, this is again, this is once you get comfortable with actually doing factoring according to different techniques here listed, sort of verbally. All right. This is more what they look like. What's actually happening? What we just did was this. We factored out a greatest common factor, right? 
It's a monomial technically, usually, all right? And then there's the leftover polynomial. It is as long as the thing was to begin with. So if it was a binomial to begin with, it's a binomial here, okay? We'll probably end up having to do this a lot. What is usually more useful as a technique is these two things in tandem, right? AC product pairs and factoring by grouping. That's me trying to give it a name, right? I've not seen the textbook really call it anything in particular. Factoring by grouping is really another technique, but doing those two things together is very useful, all right? Let's um, do some actual multiplication first. And then we'll get back into factoring. Okay. Okay. Um, sometimes you are asked seems a little random to me, but to sort of work things the opposite direction. So this would be an example of multiplying binomials. Um, and when you multiply binomials, remember that it looks something like this, just to give it a sort of generalization. A binomial has two terms, right? With some plus or some minus in between them. If you have a second binomial butted up against the first one, it would be, again, the other two terms separated by a plus or a minus. So this is a sort of generalized model here, right? The technique for multiple, this is not factoring, this is actual multiplication in this case, is you probably remember from high school if you've seen Algebra 2 FOIL, right? That's the acronym for it. It means the first thing times the first thing. All right. I always draw these little arcs to remind myself. All right. From the perspective of these, instead of being the first, but from the perspective of them being the outsides, you do that next. The outside thing times the outside thing. And then the inside times the inside. And then the last times the last lists, right? Four of, right? It is distributive property by another name, right? It's just distributing two things at once, well, one thing after the other, really. Rather than just one thing on the outside, you have two things on the outside of the parentheses, right? And they are, in fact, encapsulated together. They grouped already. It's distributive property done twice. Now, let me just mention something else also. An alternative that I thought was kind of neat is, um, is taken from, uh, say, genetics. Right. You can draw these things called Pune squares. And at least uh, you, you might try this as an option when you're dealing with um, binomials times binomials. You probably could finagle it for other things, but this works very well for binomials. All right, Pune squares are a way of determining the probability, not necessarily the actual reality of genetic outcomes. Say whether your, uh, your children might be uh, born brown-eyed or blue-eyed or what have you, or that you have tall pea plants or very short pea plants. All right, um, anyhow, it's kind of neat. All right, and I'll come back to this. So just realize when you're multiplying, you could do what's tried and true, and I tend to rely on this myself, but if you feel a little sketchy about that, there's this other way of looking at it that I'll go back into in a moment. Pune squares. All right, um, here's an example. If you had a binomial 2x minus one, and then adjacent to it immediately, you would have x plus three. This is, even without the instruction, a multiplication problem, right? Because there is no sign in between these parentheses, right? If you just see a parentheses butted up against the second set, 
it is implied that they're being multiplied together, right? If you see a plus in between them, then the parentheses are basically superfluous. They don't really need to be there. Anyhow, let us apply the distributive property twice, which is foiled by another name. Right? 2x times x, you are going to add the exponents when they're the same basis. So you end up with 2x squared. Then you distribute 2x to 3, all right? This doesn't have a letter x, but it's going to get one, just the one that was there. And when you multiply 2 times 3, you get 6. The sign combination dictates that it's a positive 6. Right? When you distribute negative 1 to x, you get another negative x. I'm going to put the 1 here now because I'm going to have to combine these later. All right? And then negative 1 times 3 is minus 3. And you might go, done, I'm out of here. <laughs> All right, but don't go away too quickly. Because what usually happens is that the jump that lands in the middle here is something that can be uh, combined by adding or subtracting. Right? What you want to do is you want to combine like terms. Just to remind you, because this will be useful later. Um, remember, it is the sign combinations that actually dictate the operation, right? For adding or subtracting integers, right? things that have a negative or a positive for all intents and purposes, right? If they're the same signs, right, then you actually add. Right? If you have one of each sign, then you subtract. Right? And the sign of the answer matches the larger magnitude. I hate to say the word magnitude, but I really have to as a technicality. The bigger digit is really the more com comfortable colloquial way of speaking, but anyhow, let's do this. These are like terms because they're the same letter and they're the same degree technically, right? So I can add or subtract like terms. What the outcome will be is dictated by rules of signs for adding or subtracting integers, which are different than those for multiplying and dividing. If they're the same signs, I'm going to actually add. If they're one of each, I'm going to subtract. In this case, what do you see? One thing is a positive, one thing is a negative. So they're one of each, therefore I legitimately have to subtract. That will establish the digit that is the coefficient in front. What is 6 minus 1? 5. With an x attached to it. Right? What is the sign of this 5? It matches the larger magnitude. So if the larger magnitude, the distance from 0 to 6, is a positive, then that is a positive. And the junk that is sitting next to it here, 2x squared, gets carried down. And the junk that is sitting here, minus 3, also gets carried down. This is the answer. 2x squared plus 5x minus 3. Now as an option, if again, you feel a little sketchy about this still, try Pune squares. Right? It works like this. Basically, the binomial that you see first may be right along the top. 2x minus 1. And the binomial terms that you see in the second, right along the side. x plus 3. Include their signs. All right. And now multiply them to get to the boxes here. All right. So... 2x times x is still 2x squared. Um, x times negative 1 is still minus 1x. 3, I'll put this in green maybe just to make it distinct. 3 times 2x is positive 6x. And 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Maybe you need to check your number. Now what usually happens is that... Um, the things that are diagonal here are like terms. Not 100% of the time, I'm sure, but uh, it really depends on what you're working with. But uh, um, okay. you can combine these just as you had before. 
six x minus one x is still positive five x. Right. This is more or less in, in a genetics class. This, this would be the genetic alleles of your mother and your father, right? Or of a, some species of plant, you know, their its parents, right? <laughs> And these would be the individual kids, you know, not really, it would be the probability, all right, uh, which may or may not materialize, right? If you had, say, for example, um, three out of four squares with the same feature, that would mean that uh, the, the offspring would have a 75% chance of being like that feature, all right? Anyhow. Just be familiar with it one way or the other, right? Now let's do factoring, which is the opposite of this. This is actually multiplying. Now we're going to go back to factoring. Okay. And how does this help you do Coffee here. Okay. Um, all right. Here's an example of factoring. Right. We're going to factor x squared plus six x plus eight. Now, there's a lot to say about this. All right. Um, I'm going to go back to this sheet here and also this. Please, if I encourage you to do anything well, all right, when you are factoring, always start with the most basic technique. Right? It is really only when this technique fails, the top one here, that you move on to more complicated techniques. All right? From this perspective, right? You're gonna to try to write one thing outside of a parentheses, right? If that doesn't work, then you're probably gonna do these two things in tandem, all right? Which I'll, I'm gonna probably have to blow this up for a moment to show you, all right? All right, now, uh, to take my own advice, I'm going to do that, all right? I'm gonna say, well, maybe what I can do is take this and factor it, it's not gonna work out, but uh, factor it out like so. Right? I'm going to try to get one thing in common on the outside. And ideally, it would be a GCF. It's a monomial because of its size All right? and its width. Now, because this is a trinomial, the leftovers that would be in here would be also a trinomial. Right? And it would be pluses here and pluses here. Okay? If you examine the, the more obvious uh, feature, the letters involved here, all right? In order for you to put some letter on the outside of this parentheses, let's say I wanted to put an X here, there would need to be an X in all three things. And in this case, there isn't, all right? An X only suits the first two things. It's not in the third. Therefore, that is not what they have in common across the three of them. And therefore, you cannot put an X on the outside of this parentheses here. Shucks, right? Let's consider the numbers involved then, all right? The, no, the coefficient here would be one, which means that the only factor it has is one. The coefficient here is six. The factors are one and six and two and three, right? The, the coefficient, this, this is a constant technically, all right, is eight. So it has factors of one and eight and two and four. If you examine the factors of one, six, and eight, all right, what is the GCF in this particular case? It's really, the only thing that is consistently true across all three of them is the number one. If you put the number positive one here, that is not going to diminish the term here, here, or here, which means it's kind of pointless to do this. The only time that it might be practical to use the number one is if for some reason you needed to factor out a negative, and that's not happening in this case, right? I wouldn't throw away this entirely, but 
this is a dead end for all intents and purposes. And now that I have discovered that the GCF is one, all right, so try next uh, method, all right, I am actually going to move on. This isn't enough as a technique. We need something more sophisticated than this. Here's a little summary before I move on, right? When you're looking for GCFs, right? You're gonna be looking for the GCF of the, the numbers. And you're gonna be looking for the GCF of the letters, for all intents and purposes. The variables and the coefficients or the constants, I should really say. What I would do in a situation like this when I'm looking for the GCF of the numbers involved is list the factors to compare. That's what I wrote above each of them, right? Factors of one is really just one. The factors of six of one and six and two and three, they're pairs, right? The factors of eight are one and eight and two and four. So I listed them for this sake, right? When you're dealing with the letters, they have to be, first of all, the same letter, right? And what you want is the, for ironically, for GCF, you want the lowest available power of the letter in common. Now, remember, it has to be across the whole thing. All right, can't just be the first two things, in which case it would have chose X to the first degree. All right, it has to be a situation where this had an X as well and it didn't. So anyhow, I cannot go further with this method, is the point. All right, so we'll do the next thing. Let me turn on my projector and then I'll come back to this. Because I wanted to just sort of um, circle things. the lights now. Okay. You want, you All right. Let us look at this sheet. had, as I suggested, a tried method one here, factoring out a greatest common factor. The greatest common factor was one, and so it really wasn't helping. What I'm now going to try uh, these two things in tandem, um, just really giving it a name based upon how it looks. AC product pairs in tandem with factoring by grouping. These are actually two different things, but they work well together. So factoring by grouping is one part of it. AC product pairs is the second part of it, all right? What is the AC product pairs? AC product pairs is referring to the coefficient of the very thing in front and the constant that is at the back, all right? And intentionally multiplying those things together. They form a product naturally, all right? Once a person has established what the product is, they can make a list right, of factors that make that product. Ultimately, what you're going to do is you're going to take the middle term, and even if it sounds kind of crazy, you're going to split the middle term into two pieces. All right? It's either going to be a sum, two things added, or it's going to be a difference. And you might say to yourself, well, geez, isn't that making things worse? Because it was three terms wide, and then it's going to end up being four terms wide. For the moment, it's going to look like it's worse. But the reality is that once you get it to the four term wide polynomial, even if it started out as three, you only have to pay attention to two of them at the same time. It will be easier to factor, ironically. This is the whole point of it, right? What you're hoping is going to happen is that when you're factoring a little bit further down the pike here is that you're going to get a match 
from factoring, and then you're going to have some extra junk that you're going to butt together, right? That's basically an overview of what's going to happen. Now, let me go back and do the actual examples so you see what the intricacies work out to be. Okay? Trust me for a moment. Trust that man. Yes. It's highly suspicious, right? When somebody tells you, hey, 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 trust me. Right? It's like Pinocchio. What a great day it is outside. All right. So let's do this example together. Now walk you through it nice and slow. All right? Okay. We're looking at a model that is... Um, I'm going to put a little in a little thought cloud up here that looks like this ax squared plus bx plus c. This is a generalization, right? I erased it, but I'll put it back now. What is the number that is sitting in this position of the first lead coefficient here? It's technically one. What is the number that's sitting at the very back here? It's eight. For right now, I know the textbook may suggest you worry about the signs. Don't. You don't pay attention to the signs at all. We're just going to take 1 and 8, and we're going to write a little table here. And I'm going to call them what they are. They are the AC product. They are two things that multiply together, the thing sitting in the front and the thing at the back. 1 times 8 is just 8. All right. Now, let us consider... Um, things that factors that make eight so ac product pairs are pairs of factors all right things that multiply together that make the product i always write them in uh sort of a stack right so you go with the easiest one one and eight right that's your first pair and then the next one would be two times something because it's an even so two times four and thankfully, it's not too complicated, right? Because this number is relatively small. There's only two pairs to choose from. Now, as I alluded to before, what you're going to do at this point is you're going to intentionally take the middle term and you're going to split it into two pieces. It's going to be something plus or minus something else. And I'm just going to erase this because I need the space. All right. Of the choices that you have established here, what maybe if you added or maybe if you subtracted would simultaneously make the number six? All right. If you added one and eight, you'd get nine. If you subtracted one and eight, you'd get seven. That's not six. All right. But if you added two and four, you would get six. And since that's the only other choice, that's what we have to go with. So I'm going to go ahead over here and put the number 2 here. And remember that this has an x attached to it. And then put the number 4 here. And again, remember that it has an x attached to it. And now, now I'm going to consider what the signs are, reminding myself of what I had mentioned before. What causes... Um, well, what do I need to have happen, right? Uh, do I need to add in this situation, or do I need to subtract? This is the first question that you have to ask yourself. In order for this to, to get bigger, right, and in order to amplify, these things need to add, right? So I'm going to go with that route, right? What causes the, what, what sign combination essentially causes adding, right? Is it same signs make things get bigger or is it one of each sign that makes things get bigger? It's the same signs. Now that could mean that I would put a negative and a negative then, right? What was the sign of the outcome in theory? A positive. So I'm gonna go with the same signs, both positive. And then the nice thing is that the junk that was sitting here, I'm just going to put x squared, goes here. And the junk that's sitting here goes here. And now, it, again, may seem crazy, 
I've taken something that was three terms wide and I made it four terms wide, right? But that is only temporary, right? The irony of the situation is that when you have a four term wide polynomial, that you only, you could now put the blinders on, all right? And basically only pay attention to two things at once, one after the other. So we're gonna, at this point, go back to the technique of trying to factor out a monomial GCF in this situation. And then the same thing over here. We'll go back to the simpler technique because we've done the more complex techniques. All right. In this particular instance, again, you're putting the blinders on, you're only paying attention to two things now rather than three. What is the obvious letter in common? It is an X, right? When you're dealing with the letters, right, you want the lowest available power. This is technically exponent of degree one. So we're gonna put a one here, technically, all right? X times what would be X squared? When you are multiplying bases, you add the exponents. One here, one here would make a two here. All right. When you're multiplying the bases, you add the exponents. Okay. X times what would be two X though? It would be plus two. The X is already accounted for. These are superfluous. I'm going to remove them now. All right. Now I'm shifting my focus over to here. All right. These do not have an obvious letter in common but they have a common factor that is a number, all right? And if you need to, list the factors of four, one and four, and two and two, and list the factors of eight, um, one and eight, and two and four, and ideally you want, remember, to GCF, right? Everything is made of the number one. If you're stuck with it, you're stuck with it, but in this case, there's a better choice. One, everything is made of, you could put that technically there. Two is evens. Right, but the best choice is the highest. It's for itself. That is the GCF that goes here. What I do pretty much all the time is I start out with borrowing the sign that is here and make it a positive four. And now again, I work it backwards. I say to myself, four times what is four X? It's X, right? Four times what is eight? It's plus two. And lo and behold, look what happened. The thing that I know from experience, the thing that I was hoping would happen, did. Right? This is what you want to have happen. When you go about the process of factoring like this, and you might be a little leery of it at first, you you want the junk sitting in here and the junk sitting in here to be an exact match. And they are in fact an exact match. I mean exact in terms of the terms and their signs. This is a positive x, this is a positive two. This is a positive x, this is a positive two. If they're jumbled, you can always rearrange them, but the signs have to be correct. That is why I don't worry about the signs until I get to this point really. All right, or when I'm maybe adding and subtracting here, All right? How it factors. Fact is like this. The match gets its own parentheses, and the junk that is on the left of each of these parentheses, and technically on the outside, the left outs, it's not a technical term, it's just how I refer to them, get their own parentheses. So the match and then the left outs. The match and then the left outs. They're on the left literally, and they're on the outside of these. So this is how this fact is, x plus 2, written once, the irony is that the GCF in this particular problem is the binomial rather than a monomial, right? and the left outs is x plus 4. Right. Now let me say something, because you're probably thinking it, and I wouldn't blame you. You might say, well, geez, dude, you know, did I really need to go through all of this trouble 
when I could have just figured it out um, a little bit more brute force. You know, you may not use that phrase. In other words, you might be thinking, well, if this is what I started with, x squared plus 6x plus 8. I, when I was in high school, was told that this is what I must do. To go directly from the trinomial to almost the factored form. And 9 times out of 10, it's a binomial sitting next to a binomial. Couldn't I just have gone directly from this to this? And I would say, yeah, in this particular case, this particular case, I would, I would probably do that myself, right? Because there's no coefficient here other than one, right? So it isn't that big. And the number at the back here is, is one digit wide. It isn't even a double digit number. So I would do that. I would say, all right, if this is x squared, it's probably x here and x here. And if this is eight, the factors of eight, again, are one and eight and two and four. Of those choices, what probably makes six? Two and four. And I go two here and a four here. And then I was an afterthought would just verify that the signs are correct. And I go, well, in order for these to add, they both have to be positive. And yes, you can get to the answer lickety split, right? If you do that. But, all right, when you have a more complicated problem as you're about to, all right? Trying to go directly from the thing given to you to the factored form is arduous. So uh, the reason that I'm over explaining the simple problem is because now you have a, a plan B, right? Rather than try to just muddle through. That in my own life, when I was in high school, I guess I did these types of problems to death, right? That's all that I remember doing in algebra too, really. Um, it's like, here, a fact of this, right? I'll be on the SATs, whatever. <laughs> Right. And you do it a lot, right? Okay. And you kind of get intuitive about it, but there's no strategy. Yeah. It's feeling around in the dark, all right? As a teacher, if you end up teaching high school kids, all right, okay. remember, you can't just go here, good luck, all right? You got to give them a strategy, all right? And I guarantee you that once you get comfortable with AC product pairs in tandem with factoring and grouping, it'll become your favorite strategy, right? Because it works. Right. And it also helps verify that something can't be vacted, that some problems can't be vacted. So let's do a more complicated problem. Thank you for humoring me. All right. Here's a problem you, you, you most definitely would not want to um, do the so-called easy way, right? All right, six x squared. This is factoring minus eleven x minus ten. All right, I'm going to try to um, keep myself confined. I'll do my work over here. When I write in my notebook, that's often what I do. I have the problem on the left side of the page and I do my scribble on the right side of the page. All right. Anyhow, to try to go from here to what this is, what I'm hoping will be a binomial times a binomial is not impossible, but it is much more cumbersome when you have an obvious number sitting up in the front here and then uh, larger than just single digit uh, constant at the back here. All right. As a matter of fact, I mean, I'm not even taking my own advice. What I really should do is try to factor out a monomial GCF first. And only when that fails, move on to more complicated techniques. If you analyze the factors of 6, though, it's 1 and 6 and 2 and 3. If you analyze the factors of 11, it's just it's prime numbers, so it's just 1 and 11. And 10 would be 1 and 10 and 2 and 5. The GCF would be positive 1. So this method would be insufficient. It wouldn't get us anywhere, really. All right, now, I'm not going to go this route, all right? Because it, it, it's too, for me at least, and maybe I'm dumb, you know? It, it's just, it's too complicated. So I'm going to go with uh, a tried and true combination of methods. And that is AC product pairs in tandem with factoring by grouping. 
this is my A, this is my C. Don't worry about the signs. Multiply them together and they form an AC product. I'm gonna make a little table and then I'm gonna list pairs of factors. AC product pairs. All right, what is six times 10? Six times 10 is 60, right? All right. Now, when I'm going to try to list the pairs of factors, there's a strategy to that as well. The strategy is that you should, first of all, you need to know your multiplication tables by heart, right? Which is why it is short-sighted of any administrator, superintendent, or what have you to say, ah, don't make them memorize that, it's old-fashioned, all right? As soon as somebody says that to you, who is in a position of authority, slap them right across the face, all right? Because they don't know what the hell they're talking about, okay? It is detrimental, right? A person needs to know, all right? Uh, they need a frame of reference. And if they memorize things when they're eight years old, the multiplication tables, they will not be struggling with this now, all right? So yeah, you could look it up, but it's, it makes it takes time to look things up, all right? So you wanna memorize certain things and multiplication tables helps. The other thing that would be good to know is the rules of divisibility, which is why, all right, I included those, all right? This is a way of determining whether these are factors in your list. I'll kind of refer to them now as I'm going through them, all right? What is the easiest pair of factors, things that multiply together that make this number 60? The number times one, right? So one and 60, all right? What is the next number after one? Two, right? Is this an even number? It is, all right? What is half of 60? 30, all right? The rule of divisibility for three is that if six plus zero is six, and you can divide by three nicely, meaning you get a whole number as a result of that, then three is in fact a factor. You could read that, that's basically what it's saying. If this divides nicely by three, all right, six plus three is just six, and six divides by negative three nicely, it's, it's two, a whole number, then the whole thing is in fact divisible by three. So it's gonna be three times something. Three times what? Three times 20, all right? I happen to know, because I can tell time, right, that 60 minutes can be broken up into four equal parts. How long is a quarter of an hour? 15 minutes. All right. And I also am blessed because my teachers had the foresight when I was eight years old to get me to memorize my multiplication tables up to 12 times 12. So therefore, five times 12 is 60 right? That's what I mean, right? Don't ever let anyone talk you or your students out of memorizing fundamental information. This is how we learn how to spell, right? English is very confusing, right? It, it follows different sets of rules. So, you know, how do you learn how to spell? You memorize it, right? Same thing with multiplication tables. Do not let an administrator get away with that, all right? Next thing, multiplication tables of six times ten, right? And at this point, what you'll notice is that you start out with two things that are as far apart as possible, and then they slowly, as you systematically go down the list here, get closer and closer and closer and closer until they're the same number in some cases, all right? That's a way of verifying that you've listed all of them. And do you have to do this every time? It would help if you did, all right? All right, all right. now, what was the whole point of this exercise? To take the middle chunk here and break it up into two pieces. All right. And from this list, we're going to decide what the numbers are that sit here and here. Whether they add together and whether they subtract somehow, we will figure out as an afterthought. All right. And exactly what the combination would be. All right. If I added 1 and 60, I'd get 61. If I subtracted them, I'd get 59. There's no way in hell it's going to be those two, all right? If I added these, I'd get 32, and if I subtracted them, 28. Still not 11. Nope, all right? Adding these, I would get 23. If I subtracted them, I'd get 17. Still not close enough. Now, 
Um, the next one. If I added them, I get 19, but if I subtract them, I would get 11. So I'm going to save this, right, and then just check the other one. Sometimes, in my own case, I'm guilty of it. I jump the gun and go, oh, yeah, well, that's the one. I get all excited. And then I find out later as I get through the signs, I go, no, wrong path. There was another choice, right? This, again, if you take the time to go through this, as arduous as it may seem at first, it is a way of validating your suspicion that something can't be facted. Because if ultimately you have one choice, and we would in this case, and then when we try to finagle the signs, it just won't work no matter what we do, it means it can't be facted. All right. Anyhow, just to check these. That's 17, not 11. All right, the eight, subtracting you get six. Uh, pardon me, seven, this doesn't work. Adding these is 16, subtracting is four, all right? It's this pair. All right, so, over here. Uh, I'm gonna put the 15 here, it doesn't matter really. And the four here. And remember that they have an X attached to them, so. Now I need to decide what the signs are. All right. This is going from something larger to something smaller, all right? What makes things smaller, adding or subtracting? Yeah. Smaller? That means you have to subtract, all right? What causes subtraction? Mm -hmm. All right, one of each sign, all right, is what causes subtracting. I mean, one of these things will have to be a negative and the other one will have to be a positive. Now, which one is it? If we want the outcome to be negative, this larger magnitude number has to be negative, right? And therefore, this has to be positive. All right, now that much is done. Negative 15 plus 4 is indeed negative 11. That means now the junk that was sitting here, 6x squared, gets carried down. And the junk that is sitting here, minus 10, gets carried down. All right. Again, a person who has no experience with this will go, you jerk, Ziggler. All right, look what you did. You made three terms, now four times. Congratulations, you made it worse. All right, it's snowing lightly. All right, but remember, the irony of the situation is that if you have something that's four terms wide, you don't need to pay attention to but two things at once. So that's why I draw this little um, divider here. I do a lot of these, so when I'm, I swear to you, when I do my own calculations like this, all right, I make these little visual cues for my own sake, and I encourage that. So now you just have to shift the focus to just these two, all right? And again, we're going to go back to the more basic technique now, which is this. Maybe there's something in common, all right, that I could rip out and put in front of the parentheses. I'm running out of breath. Okay, let's start with the more obvious thing. Um, do they have the same letter in common? They do, right? So absolutely, there's going to be an X here. The question is, X to what degree? You know, We want, when we're looking for a GCF, somewhat ironically, because it's greatest common factor, right? We want the lower power. So we really want one, right, technically. Simultaneously, we need to establish a number here, and this would definitely be something other than one. All right, the factors of six are one and six and two and three, and the factors of 15 are one and 15 and three and five. All right, everything is made of one, but what's the best choice in this case? It's three. So that is it, three X is what would be on the outside. Three X times what would be six X squared. Insofar as the number is concerned, it would be three times two. And if we wanted it to be X squared, it would be X times X, right? 3x times what would be 15x? The number would be minus 5. The x is already accounted for. All right? Now, again, a little bit of strategy. We've done this one time before, so we know kind of what we're looking for. We want, ideally, the same exact guts here. 2x minus 5 here. It might work, it might not. All right? And if, if we've gone through all of this trouble, right, and we only had one choice to choose from, and we did indeed list it all the possible combinations, then we can rule it out and say, no, nah, it's not factorable, right? Anyhow, I'm going to start with uh, the model here, which is question mark times minus 
that. And I'm going to just start this sign here to begin with. I always do that myself. All right. These do not have a letter in common, but they do have some number in common. And again, the fact is a four, one, and four, and two, and two. This is, again, imperative that a person knows their multiplication tables by heart, because it's hard to list these things if you don't have the frame of reference established somehow. Yeah, you can look it up, but it might take you longer. All right, one and 10, and two and five. All right. Um, is it one or is it something other than one is the GCF in this case? It appears to be two, right? So two is the GCF. I'm going to start with the positive two, right? Maybe if you have to, you could try to finagle the signs as an afterthought, but I wouldn't bother and, until you've gone through this first, right? Two times what is four? Two with an X attached to it is four X. Two times what is negative 10 minus five. And we have something that would kind of help us anyway, but it worked, right? Thankfully, it worked, right? Isn't it satisfying when it does? All right, well, good, all right? We have the ideal situation. We have a match here and here. This has to be exact, right? Which means that once it is an exact match, we're going to write the answer as the match, written one time, times the left outs. Okay, so what is the match? It's 2x minus 5. 2x minus 5 in the parentheses encapsulated by itself. And then the things literally on the left and on the outside next to it. A natural question that comes up oftentimes is, well, should I put the 3x plus 2 in the front and the 2x minus 5 after it? It wouldn't matter if you did it one way or the other, right? And anybody that fights with you over that is just being, you know, twitty. All right. And you would get the same answer either way. There's, they're commutative in this, in this sense. Whew. I'm running out of breath. All right, so 2x minus 5 times the quantity 3x plus 2. You might scoff at this, especially, again, if you feel a little sketchy about it, it's temporary. All right, I promise you that the more that you do anything, the better that you get at it and the more intuitive it becomes. It's still better. Even if you feel struggle initially, then feeling around in the dark and hoping that you bump into the answer. Don't do that. All right. Especially in the position of math teacher. All right. You cannot give you, you can't go here, kid. Good luck with that. You know, throw them out in the ocean and go, figure it out. <laughs> you need to give them a life preserver. All right. Now, what is the whole point of any of this? A person ideally is if they're good at factoring, if they establish better and better acquaintance and comfort and technique with factoring, will be able to solve more complicated problems, namely quadratic equations. That's what we'll do now. Right. The strategy right, to solve quadratic equations is this. Right. As a preliminary step, right? Um, hopefully, I was telling that correctly. As a preliminary step, step zero, if you will, right? Make sure that it is in standard form. It has to look like standard form. All right. What is that? Again, I'm going to refer to this page here. Standard form is when you have all of the interesting junk on one side of equals and zero on the other, right? And since it's a, a quadratic, the lead um, term is degree two. So exponent of two for the X, okay? You want it to look like that, all right? A X squared plus B X plus C equals zero. Right. intentionally rewritten this way if it's not given to you. How to get it to look like that? Perform algebra to move stuff over equals if you need to. Right. The real thing that you're gonna to try to do is these two things in tandem also, right? You're gonna try firstly to factor by whatever means necessary. All right, and then two, you're gonna take advantage of something that is 
given a name you really intuitively already know. It's called the zero product rule. Right? The zero product rule is this in a nutshell. Right? And I know that you know this. What is zero times anything? <laughs> I'm going to write it out. What is zero times anything? It equals what? It's zero, right? right? What if I switch the position of anything at zero? What if I wrote it like this? What if I put anything in front? Anything times zero. What is that? Also zero. So this is unnecessary to say this, but I'll do it anyway. What is zero times zero? Because that qualifies as anything itself, right? All right, zero, right? That is the zero product rule. Now, what's gonna be different once you have something in facted form is that you're gonna have some junk written in parentheses, right? All right? And usually what it is is that it's something, a parentheses butted up against the second parentheses. Not all 100% of the time, but often is the case. So imagine instead of using multiplication X's, I had something in parentheses butted up against something in parentheses, and one of those things is zero, right? And that is the outcome. By sheer logic alone, even if it's nebulous, even if it's mysterious, even if it's weird looking, right? Same thing, even if I switch the position, the ugly something in front times zero would still have to be that. Even if both of the things are zero, both of the factors, right? So just knowing that, is very empowering. You can figure out, infer, by sheer logic alone, what x has to be, whatever what the variable is. That's this basic strategy. And this is, of all of the techniques of solving a quadratic, this is the go-to one, really. It's only when it doesn't factor that you try the bazooka here, you know? Reserve the bazooka for weird, unfactorable things. Yes, would the bazooka work for um, anything? Yes, it would work with anything. But again, sometimes it's more trouble than it's worth. All right, so let's do some examples. Okay, and you know what? I'll try to um, um, try to confine myself again. Let me do these two things adjacent, at least. All right. Here's two examples in which we would do these two steps. Right? We're going to now solve uh, this thing that is already facted. And then in a moment, we'll do this one. We're going to solve um, x squared minus 8x is equal to negative 15. All right. Now, this one, somebody has already done step the most the preliminary step of getting 0 on one side and step number one that they have factored. Right. Now, the only thing to do once something is factored like so is to use the zero product rule. What I do, again, I drew these little visual cues for my own sake. I drew a little lightning bolt in between these two things. It's my way, personally, of going, hey, Ziggler, pay attention to just these two things. Maybe this fact that x plus 4 by itself equals 0, all right? Simultaneously, maybe x minus 3, this factor by itself, maybe that equals 0, right? And what I end up with in both of these cases, and yes, I do have to write them, all right, as little teeny tiny room equation is like this, right? This is the zero product rule. Um, once I've done that, 
I now have two little tables that I could solve this and this independently of one another. All right. Now, these, notice that this is degree one, that is degree one. These are linear equations. So how am I gonna go about the process? I'm just gonna move stuff from here to here over equals via opposite operations. What is the opposite of adding four? Subtract four here and do it to both sides. Right? There is intentionally cancellation effect. What is left over here? X is equal to the outcome of zero minus four, which is negative four. Save that, that's one answer. This one, linear, just gonna drag this over here by adding opposite operations. And then these will cancel. And then this ends up being x is equals to zero plus three outcome is positive three. Okay, that and this is my second okay. answer, right? Here's an interesting fun fact. When you have linear equations, degree one equations, you have usually one answer. When you have quadratics, which are based upon a square, right, you end up with two answers. And it's like that into infinity. If you were solving a cubic equation, that is the exponent degree would be three, all right, you will have three answers, even if it's the same answer written twice, all right? All right? And if you had a, something with exponent four, four answers, again, if, even if there's duplicates, all right? It's like that into infinity. So. Linear equation, degree one, one answer pretty much most of the time, right? Quadratic, expect two, right? That's why there's two, right? This is a quadratic. So expect two answers, right? Two solutions. If I were a good guy, I would take the time of checking this, but I'm not gonna be good today because I have to take my sister to the optometrist, all right? Sorry. So I got a bubble. All right, now, this one requires prep work, right? So, what we need to do is manipulate the appearance of this. We want it again to be ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. And right now, uh, some of the interesting stuff is on two sides. So, we're going to move 15 to start with. How do I move 15, negative 15 from here to here? When you go over equals, you're applying algebra. So opposite operations. The opposite of a negative is the positive. So you're gonna add 15 and I'm running out of space so I'm just gonna pop 15 here. There's a cancellation effect. I'm gonna fill the void. Normally I wouldn't bother, right? But I'm gonna fill the void with zero. And that means that this is really x squared minus eight x plus 15. Right? I have it in standard form. Now, because again, I have experience, right? I'm gonna do um, uh, what comes intuitively, right? All right? Don't fight your intuition, it is a blessing, all right? But just be aware, keep it in the back of your head. You have lots of different options, right? It's empowering when you realize that, right? This, if I attempted to factor, and I should try, mono, and then some leftovers, the GCF is gonna be one, so this isn't gonna work, all right? If I do the next thing, which is maybe plus or minus a binomial, and then a second binomial, all right? It's probably gonna work, all right? Now, because this isn't too complicated, there isn't a number here, I'm going to take the advice of, I'm gonna to try to go directly from this to this, all right? Just for the sake of expediency. If this is x squared, nine times out of 10, what is the thing that lands in the front of each of these parentheses? It's x. So there'll be an x here and there'll be an x here. If this is 15, all right, for a moment, consider what makes 15. One times 15 and three times five, all right? Of those choices, what is probably gonna make eight? If I maybe add them, maybe subtract them. Probably three and five. So I'm gonna put five here and three here. It doesn't matter if you switch it, right? Now, as an afterthought, I'm going to figure out what the signs are. These are smaller than this. So therefore, they need to amplify rather than diminish. What causes things to get bigger, adding or subtracting? Adding causes things to get bigger. 
amplification, if you will, right? to get bigger rather than a shrink out of existence. So I need them to add. What is the sign combination that causes adding? Same signs cause adding. Now, they're either going to be both positives or they're going to be both negatives. If I want the outcome to be negative, they both have to be minus. Okay, there's a lot of things that once you get comfortable, you could talk yourself through the process. All right. All right. Now, last thing is I have this factor, great, right? But I need to solve it. So, in order to solve this, I'm going to take advantage of the zero product rule. The zero product rule again is just subscribing a name to something that you intuitively know, which is that zero times anything is equal to zero. So maybe this first factor is equal to zero. I'm gonna write a teeny tiny little equation as a result of that thought. Maybe this thing, this factor, x minus five, maybe that thing is the zero. All right. So I'm gonna write a teeny tiny equation that equals that thought, All right? All right, so now you have two small linear equations Ultimately, the foundational rules, that's the one blessing of math, right? The one thing, people should love math for that reason, right? It is consistent, all right? The foundational rules, once they, they're solidified, all right, they don't go away, all right? We're going to solve this linearly now, all right? All right, so how do I move three from here to here? I add. So in this case, x is equal to positive three. That's one of the two. Solutions, right? How do I move five? I add five. In this case, x is equal to positive five. Two answers, x is three, x is five. Sorry, I'm panting. I just, I just love math, all about that. It's just like a rabid, rabid math guy. All right, stop me before I do math again. All right. Too serious, so. Okay, now a couple of things. Just again, uh, we reinforce this. All right, we're going to use the quadratic formula now. All right, have this reference. And in the long run, again, for the same reason I tell you, memorizing your multiplication tables is a good strategy. It helps you do things more efficiently. Right? If there's something that you might do in your head, it would be know that six times five is say thirty, something like that. Just the single digit times the single digit, all right? But um, these would be good to know. The square root of perfect squares, right? Square root of one is one, square root of four is two, square root of nine is three, square root of 16 is four, 25 is five, 36 is six, and so forth. In my own experience, it is good to know up to 10 times 10, right? Is, you know, the, as a radical is uh, 100, square root of 100 is 10, right? Why? Because the quadratic formula involves a square root. So, here on this sheet, you have the quadratic formula written, all right? All right? And this is basically the procedure, all right? Again, these things in between, you're not really responsible for, they just exist. If you're wondering, how on earth did we come up with we, yeah, like I invented it. Um, how on earth did math people um, arrive at the quadratic formula. It came from one of those other techniques on the same overview. Right. There's a method for solving quadratic equations called completing the square. Right. Again, you're not responsible for that. But they took the model that was the standard form, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, and rearranged it according to the technique that is known as completing the square method. And when you do that, this is the end result. This came from ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero rearranged, essentially via completing the square technique. Right. 
Anyhow, again, this is the bazooka, right, which we will reserve for probably special situations. It would, in fact, work with anything. But again, you see that there is a radical in here. There is a square root. Right? That's what this is referred to as. The symbol is a radical. All right? um, it might be more cumbersome than necessary. You could just factor something. You don't have to go through this trouble. Anyhow, what you do is you just, you have your thing in standard form, whatever the uh, quadratic is given to you, and you pluck out those three numbers and you stuff them in here, all right, in the formula. And then you follow the order of operations, which really just means you're gonna be paying attention to this, all right, first. Right. Anyhow, there's a name for this, the guts here, are referred to as the discriminant. Right. And if this ends up being a negative, that means there's no real solution. Right? Which means an imaginary or complex solution would in theory exist, but it's not practical for us. All right. You probably are in Mat 114, you're probably not gonna see anything that's imaginary. All right, anyhow. Just be aware that's the name of it, and that's its job, right? To discriminate between what is real and what is imaginary. Okay. Um, what's another thought? Yes. Yes. Let me just uh, reinforce something here. The discriminant sometimes... Um, sometimes the discriminant needs to be facted, so just be aware of that. All right, thank you, dear. Have a great day. Bye-bye. All right, now when you're factoring radicals, there's this situation. Factoring radicals, are, you're not going to get a nice whole number as an answer. You're going to get some chunk that is written in a radical. Um, this is basically the strategy. You want to break it up into two pieces, right? This is known as the product rule of radicals, if you wanted to get technical. And in the first one, you want the highest perfect square, or if it was a cube root, a highest perfect cube that is possible. Like, you know how before when we were factoring, we wanted the GCF, the highest possible number that we could choose. Well, when you're dealing with radicals, you want the highest possible perfect square. Why? Because that chunk of the two will escape the radical eventually, all right? Well, if you strategically choose that as the first thing, then what would be in the second factor would be leftovers, really. But the leftovers will be technically a prime number or a composite number, like six, that would be impractical to go any further with, uh, to factor further, all right? So let me give you an example. And we'll go through this. Right. The irony is that even though people don't like radicals because they're kind of alien, um, they are a better summary for an irrational number. An irrational number is something that is infinitely stretching and it looks like a bunch of random digits. Like pi is famously an irrational number, 3.14159, right? Whatever it is beyond that, I don't know. All right. Um, rather than write out all those digits, and it would be futile anyway because it's infinite, it is more concise to leave the radical. So we want to factor it so that it is as small as possible. It's more convenient and when it's compact. Right. Let's do an example. Um, here's our example. I'll put it up here in black. All right, we're going to solve um, using the quadratic formula. 4x squared minus 8x equals negative 1. Now, here's another side note. I, this is what I forgot to mention. When do you want to do this? You want to use this when you cannot factor 
right? Ideally, when something is unfactorable, right? This is the choice, the option. Then you take out the bazooka, right? So let me try to solve this in the old-fashioned, you know, so-called old-fashioned way, which is factoring first. Right? I'll write it here. If I have 4x squared minus 8x equals negative 1, right? whether I factor it or I use the quadratic formula, I want this to be arranged to simulate standard form. That is all the interesting stuff on one side and 0 on the opposite side. So that just entails... Um, moving the 1 from here to here, right? Which means that I would add 1, and this would be 0, and I would add 1, and this would be 4x squared minus 8x plus 1 equals 0, right? Now, because I have a coefficient up in the front 4, I would maybe explore the AC product pairs factoring by grouping technique. But even before I do that, all right. I would again try to rip out a monomial GCF and see if I could just shrink it first. All right. Um, if you examine factors of four, four is one and four and two and two. If I examine factors of eight, it would be one and eight and two and four. And if I examine factors of one, it would just technically be one. Right. What is the GCF of these three things? It's just one. So at that point, it will go, I can't go this route. It's not really helping me. So then you go, all right, fine. Let me try AC product pairs. And AC product pairs would say, take the thing in the front, the A, take the thing in the back, and multiply them together to form an AC product. All right, and then list pairs of factors right, to see ultimately what I could split the 8 into. Right? 1 times 4 is just 4. And then I still have this situation of these are the two pairs. 1 and 4 and 2 and 2. All right? Is there any way in hell that if I add or subtract that I'm going to produce an 8 using these choices? I can't. All right? And because if I add 4 and 1, I'm going to get 5. Right? If I subtract them, I get 6 more, so I'm going to get 3. If I add these, I'm just going to get 4, and if I subtract, I get 0. That's not 8 in either case. You might get annoyed right, and go, why did I waste my time? All right? What I have proven by going through this pain in the neck is that it's not possible to factor. When these options are the only options you have, it means this is not factorable, which means now I have decided... Factorable is even a word. It's not factorable. Now I have no choice but to use the bazooka here. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the thing that I have accomplished, at least rearranging it here, and put it on top because I need the space here. So this is really 4x squared minus 8x, all right? And the way it worked out after moving one is it's plus one equals zero for this this problem, right? When I cannot factor, that is when it is really appropriate to use the quadratic formula. Would it work for any situation? It would indeed, all right? But again, you, you, it may be more trouble than it's worth, all right? You will decide for yourself, okay? So... I'm now going to systematically insert, that is really called substitution, the coefficient 4, negative 8, and 1 in those appropriate places in the formula. And what you do need to be careful of is um, take the sign with them. So this is really negative 8, right? And this is really positive 1, and that's really positive 4. I'm going to superimpose these on my scribble here, all right? Uh, what I would encourage you to do is draw little parentheses and then insert the number in them because, like in this case of an exponent, you don't want to accidentally apply the exponent to just the digit. You want to make sure the sign gets it too. There happens to be a negative here, but it's negative times negative. All right? Same thing with this b value. So this is negative 8 squared. All right? 
there's a minus in the formula, then times four, and then it's times four, the A, in two places, down here and up here, and then there's just the C value, which is one, all right? To write it a little bit nicer and neat, I'll do that now. All right, X is gonna be equal to negative negative eight, plus or minus the square root of negative eight squared, minus four times four times one, the whole thing sitting on top of two times four. Okay, now you should follow the order of operations because you're working strictly with the one side of the equation. So you're just trying to simplify this expression. Right? You're not moving anything over equals anymore. So order of operations, pretty much what you see is what you get. What does that mean? It means that your focus should really be inside the discriminant first. Right. And so pay attention to this. Again, that would ultimately decide whether you have something that's real or not. And if it's not real, there's no answer for, uh, for our purposes. All right, you have a choice between squaring, subtracting, or regular multiplication. Technically, what should you do first? You should do the squaring first, which means that this would be plus or minus 64, and it would be a positive, this is a negative times a negative, that's because it's affected by that as well, all right? And then you have minus, this would be the next step logically, so I'm gonna, you know, just write it here. Four times four times one, which is 16. That's too much, okay? On the outside, well, I'll skip that. I'll just continue with this inside go to. What is 64 minus 16, right? Ideally, it would work out to be a perfect square number like 25 or something. It isn't going to happen in this case. What's going to happen is that this is going to be plus or minus the square root of 48, right? right? Which is not impossible. It is real, right? But it's not going to work out warm and fuzzy. You're not going to get a nice, nice, satisfying whole number as an outcome. You're going to get stuck with a facted form of this. All right. And that warrants some explanation. So let me erase this stuff and explain the details. All right. What do I have at this point? Well, if I straighten up the outside first, you don't have to really. All right. You really would deal with this before anything else. All right. Um, the, the eights would become a positive, right? I'm just doing this because I know I can get away with it. I want to shrink it so that we have no choice at this point. A person might just go, ah, it's done. You know, one thing in the radic hand here. And then at the bottom, it was two times um, four, right? So that would be eight down here, right? You'd have this, if you, if, if you gave up on factoring this, you would go, all right, the outside is a negative times a negative, so it becomes a positive eight, and the bottom will be two times four, and you'd have eight down there, all right? And you might go, done, ha, 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 I'm out of here, all right? But remember, you might be asked to factor this, right? Now, here's the ideal situation, how it would work. All right, you can factor a radical. And a radical is a fancy way of saying the thing with that hat on it, right? The inside guts of this is known as a radicand, right? That is the inside, right? Anyhow, we factor it in ideally this situation. The highest, because it's a square root, perfect square possible. And then the second factor would be a leftover for all intents and purposes, right? The thing that is unfactorable further or would be impractical to. And how would you decide that? Basically, you have to list all of the factors of 48. So I'm gonna do that here. What is 48? If 48 was a product, right? What would be the pairs of factors that make 48? The easiest pair is 1 times 48, right? 
Then I use rules of divisibility. This is even, so it's 2 times something. It would be 2 times 24. And then I know my multiplication tables, right? 3 times 16, all right? You can always divide by 3 and just check it, and that's how you're going to get it anyway. Um, 4 times 12. I know my multiplication tables of 4 and 12, right? Otherwise, brute force divided. You can use a calculator if you have to, all right? If the rule of divisibility for 6 is interesting, if you have established that 2 and 3 definitely works, and they do, got whole numbers here, then 6 would work. Anyhow, I know my multiplication tables of 6. 6 times 8 is 48, right? And again, you know you're done when you started out really far apart and they get really close, and you've gone through this systematically. This is pretty much it. Now, now I need to have my reference if I don't have this memorized, right? which is... A list of perfect squares, right, which is the numbers that you see here. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 64, 49, uh, 81, 100. It would be good to know a lot of them, but at least up to 10 times 10. All right. Anyhow, these are perfect um, because they produce whole number outcomes here. All right. When you take the square root of a perfect square number, it's not irrational, it's not infinitely stretching, right? Like pi, right? It's a nice whole number. Anyhow, there are some of them hidden in here, right? One is a perfect square, all right? Um, four is a perfect square, and 16 is a perfect square, all right? How do I know? Well, um, they're in this list here, <laughs> and I've memorized it. All right, anyhow, so that means that the number that is the highest perfect square possible when I'm factoring 48, all right, is what? Am I going to go with 1? Am I going to go with 4? Am I going to go with 16? Strategically, you want to go for the highest, so you're going to go with 16, all right? What is it times 16, all right, that makes actually 48? The leftover is... The thing that can't be factored any further, all right, what would be impractical, it would be 3, all right? So it's 16 times 3. Now, again, you might not see an immediate benefit to that, but at least the benefit is this. We're preserving the infinitely stretching decimal. If I didn't do this, if I didn't factor this, I'd have to round something, which is, if you say you were in engineering, you don't want to round something, all right? It will cause danger, all right? Anyhow... At least part of this will escape, right? The radical. What is the square root of 16? It's 4. So in a more concise way of writing this, 4 times, because they brought it up against one another, 4 times the square root of 3 is the same decimal as 48. And this is better, arguably, because they're smaller numbers. So what does this become? It becomes... 8 plus or minus 4 times the square root of 3. All right. Now, you might be wondering, well, geez, why is there a plus minus here stacked? That is an abbreviation for the two answers. Remember, quadratics produce two answers, all right, of what is possible. In one situation, you might add 8 plus 4 square root of 3 over 8. And in the second instance, you might add, or pardon me, you subtract 4 square root of 3 over 8. All right, remember, your quadratics are going to give you two answers. That's one of them, and that's the other one. A square root is asking what identical factors make this number underneath the radical, the radicand, the guts. Well, there's technically two. Positive 4 times positive 4 would make positive 16. But technically, negative 4 times negative 4 would also make positive 16. That's why they abbreviate it like that. They stack them. So they don't have to write it twice. Like they. Who is they? All right. All right. Now, what you can do is simplify a little bit further. How so? Well, there's two ways, and this is, the, to me, the faster. When you've gotten it down to, basically, these things are sharing the denominator of 8, you could break this up into two fractions, which means that we could factor the top. 
all right, it's your choice, which means that this is 8 over 8 plus 4 over 8 with a square root of 3 attached to it, all right? And in this case, it's the same thing, all right? This would be 8 over 8 minus 4 over 8 square root of 3. If it is possible to shrink this any further, do so, all right? And you only know by looking, all right? What can you do to simplify? What is a number divided by itself, really? It's 1. This is plus, in this case, this is minus. What is 4 over 8 simplified? I know it has this ugly thing attached to it. Forgive it for that. All right? Just simplify the fraction part. That is in front, or you could say tuck it underneath it if you like. All right? It's really 1 half. All right? You could verify this with a calculator if necessary. So what is the most concise way to write this? All right? Maybe beating a dead horse here, but the most concise way of writing this is like this that x is equal to 1 plus or minus the square root of 3 over the number 2. All right? Plus or minus accounts for these two possible situations. In one instance, you would add, and in the second instance, you'd subtract. All right? Why not bother to actually do the subtraction? Because this is an irrational number. And an irrational number is an infinitely stretching decimal that has no obvious pattern and therefore cannot really by itself be written as a fraction. It's part of a fraction in this case, but the top cannot be expressed as a fraction. It's not rational, right? It's irrational, the top, all right? So this is, summarizes all of infinity without chopping it off, right? Again, if you were in science or engineering, you don't want to round, especially in mid-calculation, because it's gonna, it potentially will be dangerous if you do that, all right? Okay, that is that. Now, um, let me walk you through this word problem. That is the back, and then we are done. Okay, so here's this. Okay. And I gotta boot up my computer here. Just my lights here, and I'll walk you through this. Okay. And I'm going to turn on the projector. This is going to involve um, um, a solving technique at some point. Let me read this to you. Um, is that visible without the curtain? No, I don't know. I didn't have to rain snow. Right, it's a little bit fit, uh, closer up. All right. Dana and her husband recently installed an in-ground rectangular swimming pool. All right. Um, it's probably setting a bad example, but whenever I see the word that refers to a shape, my instinct at this point in my life is going, there's a rectangle. All right. I draw it. <laughs> Swimming pool, and its dimensions are 40 by 30, so, yeah, pools aren't usually red, but hey, whatever. This is a pool, all right, and it's 40 by 30, all right? They want to add a brick border that is uniform, meaning it's the same thickness width all the way around it, all right, around all the sides. So, again, if it's the same thickness all the way around it, it is implying in a very subtle way that it's just a larger rectangle encapsulating the smaller pool rectangle. Okay. So you have something like that. Right. How wide can they make, it should be they, it's a typo, the brick border. That is the brick border that is this around the pool here. Right. Given those dimensions, if they purchased just 296 square feet of bricks, right? Having sort of drawn a picture, right? And I know that they have 296 uh, square feet. Feet, right? Yes. I'm gonna put feet squared, 
total to work with, I have all the information I need. All right. Let me get rid of this and I'll show you how you get through it. Isn't really hurting anything, right? If it gets cumbersome, I'll do it. I'll get rid of it. I would start with this, all right? We're gonna, as a strategy for solving word problems, you can borrow formulas. The formula that would be pertinent would be the area of a rectangle formula, all right? Which is area is equal to length times width. We definitely need that. Right? Then there is a formula that you can sort of derive, right? I use this a lot myself, right? Which is that. A total that is given, all right, minus a known amount that is given would equal the unknown that they're asking about. We're going to modify this. Let me get rid of the projection because I think it's a little too much. All right, a total minus a known amount is going to be an unknown amount. Here's how I would modify this, all right. The total in this case is going to be an area. All right. The known that is in this case is also going to be an area. And the unknown is going to be an area as well. Okay, now, to be more specific, right, what is the total area? The total area is going to be the larger rectangle. The known area is going to be the pool area, which is the smaller rectangle. All right. And the unknown is going to be the rectangular brick donut, for lack of a better phrase. Right. Rectangular, shall we say, brick donut. Right. Why do I say brick donut? Because the pool is basically the hole. Right. It looks like a transformer. If you've ever seen a transformer, uh, that is a literal transformer, all right, for voltages, all right? In a schematic, it's usually a rectangular block like that. Anyhow, it kind of, imagine the square universe where donuts were not round, okay? The green uh, square donut with the hole in it, right? That's this unknown area. Why do I care about that? Because we're trying to figure out uh, what the dimensions uh, could be in terms of thickness all the way around this. They want to know how wide it could be and it would have to be uniformly the same all the way around. Right? I'm still going to whittle this down further. Right? Let me start with some things that I know. Right? This brick patio that goes all the way around the donut all right, let me refer to as what it would be maximum in the ideal situation. It would be 296 square feet. The unit you don't really have to write, but that's what it would have to equal, all right? The pools area, we could pretty much figure out right off the bat because they gave us the dimensions. It's 40 and it's 30, right? So this pool area would be, all right? It would be 40 times 30, right? Feet times feet. And then there's this total area. We don't yet know the dimensions of the green, but that's part of the question, really. So what I'm gonna do just temporarily, and this is still minus, is I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna just put a, a vague reference to the formula for area, right, in here, all right? And I'm not even gonna use a, a L and W, I'm just gonna use two question marks to represent it. It's really just two things multiplied, right? So it's something times something. So a length and a width eventually, right? Minus this number is equal to that number. We're specifically looking for the width, right? But don't worry about it just yet. Let me just try to whittle down what we can, all right? What is just 40 times 30? This is really 1,200, right? Because four times three is 12 and that's two zeros. Right. This over here, we're going to have to modify the picture to break it down a little bit further. Right. We've done as much as we can before hitting a brick wall, pardon slightly intended. All right. Here's what we could figure out. Right. 
that there's a thickness, let's just say it's a width, right? From here to here. I don't know what it is, all right? But I do know that on the opposite side of this pool, that because it's uniform, uniform, it would have to be the same number, whatever that number is, all right? So if this is from here to here, Um, shall we say, the length of the green. Yeah. What is the length of the green? It's the sum of three things. The length of the green from here to here, if I just wow. superimpose this down here on top of its parallel line, it would be the width plus 40, apparently, because that's what the pool's width is, length is, all right? Um, plus another W, right? And it's that that I could basically simplify, right? How many W's are there? There's two. So if I want to just crush this together, the length would be this. The length of the larger rectangle would be 2W plus 40, right? It's a W, it's 40, it's a second W. So 2W plus 40 is the first length. The width, on the other hand, that is the green width, if you will, running this way. The green width is this outside. Would be some of the same dimensions, right? It would be whatever the number is that the W here. I'm sure that's a there and there. So if I took this side and just superimpose it along the parallel sum, right? This would be equal to um, a W plus 30 plus W, right? A W plus 30 segments plus a W segments, right? Again, how many W's are there? There's two W's and then a third. So the second dimension would be two W plus 30 instead. And now look what you have. You have, and this is and just to label it, this is the width of the green, right? There's a binomial times a binomial that represents this larger green rectangle. I have to straighten this out and then blend together the other junk later. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically foil this stuff. And I'm gonna erase this because I don't need it. Okay, so what is 2w times 2w to FOIL it? 4w squared. Is w times w is w squared. 2 times 2 is 4. What is 2w times 30? That would be plus um, 60 with a w attached to it. What's 40 times 2w? That would be plus 80 with a w attached to it. What is 40 times 30? It's 1,200, what a coincidence, right? That's straightening this out via FOIL, doing the actual multiplication. Distributed, probably, distributed prop property done twice. There coincidentally happens to be this chunk here, minus 1,200. Yeah. And then on the opposite side, what this can only equal as a maximum is how many bricks they bought. All right, expressed as 296 square feet, all right? Let me still straighten this out. I gotta blend together this completely, which means that I have to combine the like terms, which means that this is now 4w squared plus 80 and 60 added is 140 with a w attached to it, all right? Then this is exposed, all right? Plus 1200. Minus the 1,200 that was there is equal to 296. Right. What happens with the two with the 1,200s? Yeah. They are opposite in sign and equal in magnitude. So therefore, okay. they're just they're like terms. They're constants, so they will actually cancel out of existence. Which means that this is now 4w squared plus 140w is equal to 296. If 
I'm going to try to factor this now to solve for it, I'm going to try to get it as close to standard form as possible, which means that I need to drag 296 from here over to the opposite side. Right? How do I get 296 from here to here if it's a positive on this side? I subtract it, right? 296, and I just plop it here, 296, it has no friends. All right. And this cancels, which means that this is now zero here. I'm going to purposely fill the void. I now have 4w squared plus 140w minus 296. All right. I have something in standard form. So uh, among my options that I have to choose, all right, all right, for the quadratic, and it is certainly quadratic because it's an exponent of two here, is I could try to factor it, all right, and then apply the zero product rule, or I can go for the bazooka, all right, the quadratic formula. It is factorable, right? It's just maybe a little daunting because the numbers are larger than usual, but here's the thing. If I take my own advice, which is try of all techniques for factoring the most basic first, then it will help me in, in, in vast ways, in, in incredible ways. I'm going to try this most basic technique first, just factoring out a common feature from the three terms. All right? This is a 4, this is 140, this is 296. According to the rules of divisibility for 4, Right? If the last two digits are divisible by 4, then the whole thing is divisible by 4. In some cases, you might just recognize it, and in other cases, you may not. might not. Anyhow, you only know by checking. Divide, is 40 divisible by 4? It certainly is. Right? Is 96 divisible by 4? That's the rule of divisibility for 4, checking the last two digits. It is. All right? If you divide it 4 by... 96 by 4, you get a whole number. That's what it means to be divisible, really. So act to figure out what it is, right? All right, to figure out what that factor is, I'm going to have to do the brute force division in each case, right? And see what the leftovers would be here, and here, and here. I'll do that now. If I believe that 4 is the GCF, and it would have to be in this case, right? Then this would be a 1 here with a W squared attached to it. All right, remember, factoring is dividing without consciously thinking about it. Four, uh, 140 divided by 4 is 3 with 2 left over, right? So this would be apparently a plus 35 with a W attached to it. All right, and this 296 divisible by 4. Uh, 4 goes into 29 7 times, which is 28, and the difference would be 1. 4 goes into 16 4 times. This would be minus 74. Okay, now in a more concise way of writing it, it's just w squared rather than 1, right? This may not seem like much, but here's what you can do with this. Once you have factored out a whole number here, you could pull algebra, all right? That is, move the 4 from here to there over equals. How would you do that? Divide by 4 here, there's a cancellation effect. Divide by 4 here, what's 0 divided by 4? 0. That means I just have to factor this junk now, right? Which is probably going to be a binomial times a binomial equals zero. All right? If it usually is something plus or minus something, and then something plus or minus something, we could probably get away with just doing it directly, right? W times what would be W squared? W times W. If you consider the factors of 74, that would be the hard part. We'd have to list them. So I'll do that over here. I'm going to go through the same technique. If 74 is a number that I want to list factors, start with the easy one, one times itself, right? Is it even? It is. Uh, how I will figure out what the other half of it is, I have to do the brute force division. 2 goes into 7 3 times, all right, which is 6, the difference is 1. 2 goes into 14 7 times, so it would be 2 times 37, apparently. The rule of divisibility for 3 would validate that it is 3 times something. All right? If the sum works with 3, then the whole thing works with 3. 
Uh, seven plus four is 11. Doesn't work with three. All right. If you've ruled out three as an option, then six is not an option. That's the rule for six. Rule for five. All right. Does it end at a five or a zero? No. I should really try four. So if I divide by four, four goes into this, one, two, three left over. That would be eight, but then you're going to have change, you know, a fraction or a decimal. So it doesn't work with four. All right. So we know it's one and two. It's not three. It's not four. It's not five. It's not six. I know multiplication of tables by seven is seven times 11 is 77 would be overshooting it. Eight times nine is 72. That's undershooting it. Right. And that's it. Right. It's just these two choices. Anyhow. Notice that this number here is 35, all right? If I subtract these, that would produce a 35. So it's 37 minus two somehow. That would dictate what the signs will be, all right? If I want it to be positive, the larger thing has to be positive. If I want it to subtract, that has to be one of each sign. So a positive 37 and a negative two, all right? Now, here's what I have after all of my trouble. I have it factored, great. But I need to take advantage of the zero product rule. Maybe this chunk is equal to zero. Maybe this chunk is equal to zero. If I solved for each of these independently, that would entail moving two in this case and moving 37 in this case. This would involve adding and the result would be Positive two feet because that's what the width would be, right? It's feet in this case. All right. If I move this one, it'd be minus 37. This would cancel, but then what I end up with, I got a negative 37 feet. Now, let's consider the magnitude of that width. Do you mean to tell me that you have a sidewalk around your pool that's 37 feet wide all the way around? <laughs> that's an incredible walk, not impossible, right? Uh, but that would be really impressive, all right? Anyhow, what would really rule this out as a possibility is this is negative. Even though in math world, a negative is logically possible, in real life, are there ever negative measurements of a physical dimension? No, all right? That's how you would rule this out, all right? There are, that's not a fun way to spell it, Right. There are no negative measurements in real geometry. Right. Right. So you would rule that out. It has to be, it's two feet all the way around the pool. Right. And that's that. As you can see, this problem is complex because it entails everything that has been discussed to this point. But with a little bit of effort and a lot of, you know, confidence, which only comes, you know, from doing something a lot, all right, you could talk yourself through it. And if there's anything I want to encourage you is that you have to believe because it's true, all right? Any person, all right, can figure this out. But what stops a person is they're scared, all right? As the teacher, your job is to take that fear away from them. And the only way that you could do that is to show them, listen, there are w ways to do this. It is possible. Don't be scared. All right? All right. Anyway, um, let's uh, leave it at that. All right? Do print these, all right, for homework, all right? Um, these sheets for homework. We just covered section uh, six nine. For homework, uh, do my lab uh, section 6 9 in theory. Okay? Right. That's that. Right. Thank you guys for sticking with me. All right, I'll see you again on Wednesday.